Hi, and welcome to our third lecture about Dante. Today we're going to take a look at the structure and style of Dante. And um, hopefully as I go through this, you'll also be seeing some, um, some drawings and diagrams to kind of help you understand and put together kind of the visual of how Dante envisions this whole world of the afterlife. Um, and before I start, I want to come back to a notion we talked about before uh, in the second lecture, and that was about Beatrice being this kind of idealization of perfection, at least perfection of what a woman should be in Dante's mind. And again, I'll remind you that Dante never really spent a lot of time with this woman. He just basically, as anyone who might have an infatuation or a crush on somebody, he's free to um, enforce upon her whatever standards he has. And I think that's certainly true in this example. So Beatrice, as his ideal of perfection, he places in uh, the uppermost regions of heaven. So uh, we'll start with this notion of this idea of perfection. And for Dante and the world he lived on, again, lived in, the world uh, that we now call kind of the beginnings of the Renaissance period, uh, the end of the Middle Ages, was a time period where the view of God was this notion that God was obviously perfect, but what perfection meant to the medieval mind and the Renaissance mind had a lot to do with logic and rationality. So the God that they envisioned was a God who was highly, highly rational, like at the pinnacle of it. Um, and because of that, his construction of the universe would also be considered to be very logical and ordered. So as we go through Dante, one of the things I want you to pay attention to is that he does, you know, he creates these multiple layers within all three of the sections of the uh, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. But his attempt is not to be complicated. His attempt is to show you that there is an order and there is a reason and there is a design to this universe that his perfect God has put together. And so he tries to mimic that in the poetry. So this idea of using your art as a way to recreate or restate your vision of truth and reality um, meant that Dante, along with people like Shakespeare, uh, as he would try to do with his sonnets, sometimes marry themselves to a very tight form and structure. And the idea of perfection is how closely we can continue to, to follow along that structure, to follow along that form without breaking it. So for Dante, uh, building a perfect poem had two elements. One, the subject matter had to be perfection. And in his mind, this idea of love, his, uh, his attempt to reunite with Beatrice, to reunite with God, um, was an attempt at perfection. So his subject matter, he felt, or at least we do looking back, he th feel like he felt that he was on the right track with that. But the second one is to, to use the tools of human reason to create a perfect vehicle to explain or explore this theory about the perfection of God's love. And so Dante wants to marry the form with the subject matter and thereby derive like the perfect poem uh, that can be. And so in order to do that, he creates this kind of ingenious structure. Um, so we talked before about the idea of like three different places in the afterlife. We have the Inferno, which is the first book, Purgatorio, which is an interesting notion um, it's not actually part of Catholic doctrine, but it is, uh, it is set up as, as this kind of like halfway place between heaven and hell. Uh, and then our third uh, arrival point would be, of course, paradise or paradiso, as Dante says. So we have, again, a mimic of the Trinity. Um, each of the levels is its own separate space, but together they make up one entity, kind of like this... Um, this afterlife trinity, if you want, uh, or if you will. So the number three is going to uh, play very heavily into this poem. Now, one of the first exercises I'm going to ask you to do is to take a look at the poetic structure. And Dante does something very interesting here. He sets his poem up around the number three. So you'll notice that in, uh, when you start to look physically at the poem, you'll notice that, oh, it's each of these cantos, each of these like chapters, is set up in three in stanzas, and each stanza has three lines to it. That's called the terza rima. Um, so Dante uses the terza rima throughout. So uh, each canto is broken into, and they vary in length. But basically, these little set little units of poetry called 
stanzas that are three lines long. Further, the stanzas are interlocked with one another by this interesting rhyme scheme. The first two lines of the stanza, of the terza rima, will rhyme. The middle line will rhyme with the outer line lines of the next stanza. So we get a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, and that middle rhyme acts like this thread tying each of the stanzas together throughout the poem. It's an interesting way of doing it. It's obviously going to be a, a lot easier in Italian than it would be in English, which is why the English translations typically don't try to match the, uh, the terza rima rhyme scheme that Dante uses. Um, in Italian, it's a little bit easier because all of your words typically end in a vowel, an I, an O, a U, um, a Y. So these are things that are able to that we're able to like rhyme easily. Um, so it's a little tougher when you get to, to English to try to make that. It sounds a bit forced. Uh, but I've asked you to kind of attempt his style in kind of miniature just to see if you can get it. Now to kind of round things out, he plays again off the number three. So he takes each stanza, okay, the little three line poem, and he says, I'm going to make each line 11 syllables or 11 sounds within each line. So within a stanza, you have 11, 11, 11. You have 33 sounds that are making up the terza rima or the stanza uh, that's in there. So it's an interesting play off of the number three, and Dante manages to maintain it for the entire length of this epic poem. Uh, which is quite amazing. Now, we already talked about the three levels. Uh, you'll notice since we're dealing just with the Inferno, I'll talk about that in more detail than I will the others. But if you look to this diagram I'm showing you, we're going to start by going all the way back to um, the, the theory that Lucifer, when he rebelled against God, was thrown out of heaven. He was cast out. And Dante is going to apply what we call a Ptolemaic view of the universe. That's an Earth-centered, the Earth, it's a geocentric. The Earth is the center of the universe. Everything outside of the Earth revolves around it. So what Dante has is he has the Earth sitting here, okay, and hell becomes a place in the center of the Earth, the very middle part. And if you want, as you look at the rest of the construction, purgatory is a mountain that goes above okay the plane of the earth and then ascends and at the very tip of purgatory is the beginning point of heaven heaven consists of these eight or i'm sorry ten concentric rings that are built around this middle earth okay um, those ten rings proceed outward at the very uppermost ring that tenth ring is where you find god is also where dante will find beatrice and so our story basically revolves around Beatrice understanding that Dante's at a low point, wanting to help her beloved, sending a member of, we'll call it hell, he's not actually in hell, he's in limbo, um, uh, uh, someone that Dante would trust, a man named Virgil, a poet, a dead poet, okay, uh, named Virgil, who will go and intercede for Dante uh, on behalf of Beatrice and guide him through hell, through purgatory, and then Beatrice will take over and take him through heaven and then on up uh, as she tries to instruct him how to change his life so that he can get right with his God so that he can join her at some point in heaven. Now, all of that is a long story to say. When we look at that construction, when Satan was kicked out of that tenth realm of heaven, he was plummeted and sent to the lowest point. So he crashed into the earth. He left a huge like tunnel or, or crevasse and he became stuck in the very center of earth. So the farthest point that you can get from God, that 10th ring is where Satan resides. His midpoint, his belly button, if you will, is where the lowest point of heaven is or the lowest point of the afterlife is. So Dante constructs his hell to also be layered. The deeper you proceed in hell, the worse the sinner you meet. The farther the sinner is from the love and protection and uh, intervention of God. 
So Satan, because he's the worst sinner, his sin is betrayal, he's pictured at the middle, stuck in this kind of lake of ice. And while he resides in this lake of ice, he flaps his wings to try to get out. But the more he flaps, the colder it gets. And so you'll see that hell, the, the environment of the lowest pit of hell, is really cold as hell. Okay, Other parts of hell are not as cold the farther you get. Now, as Dante will proceed down, you'll notice that hell is constructed in nine levels. Some of these levels have antechambers or sublevels. Uh, the Italian word is bolgia or bulge or pocket. Um, and you'll see centers stuck in between or inside those. Those centers are, are they're stuck in hell because they basically love their sin. They were given a choice. Do you love your God more than you love your sin? And because they could not choose their God, they chose their sin. So their punishment in heaven is to receive their sin for eternity. They just don't get it in the form in the way that they envisioned it to be. So it's kind of like getting all the ice cream you want if you love ice cream, but you're not going to get it fed to you quite the way you want. So Dante creates this elaborate schema where he begins in a place called Limbo, which is almost outer hell. Okay, You go through these gates, you go through this door, which I'll talk about in the next lecture, um, and you hit Limbo. And Limbo is housed by the people um, who are not baptized. They may have lived before Christ, so they could not be saved by Christ's message. So they reside not in hell, they're kind of, well, it's kind of the first la layer of hell, but they're kind of on the outside of it. They're not being punished, but neither can they move forward, okay? Um, and so Dante proceeds down, and I'll talk more about that construction when we get into the next lecture, which we'll be looking at the first two or three cantos, uh, two or three levels of hell. So when we look at the construction, nine levels, the further you go, the worse your sin. And your sin is considered bad by the more people it affects. So you'll notice like the early sins, like gluttony, top level sin, lust, top level sin, even though they're bad, even though they're considered to be deadly sins, they still are the type of sins that mostly affect you, okay? My gluttony is not harming you, okay? But violence, if I take your life, now I'm leaving myself and I'm actually hurting you. If I become violent toward my neighbor or violent toward myself, I'm starting to affect more and more people by my actions until we get to the lowest part of hell where you find Satan and betrayers who are betraying things like their country, their kin. And so the ramifications of what their actions are are far, more far-reaching. They are farther from God's love. Okay, So look to these diagrams. I think if you want to go back and review it, you can kind of see that construction. Um, but this notion of the threes, this notion of divine unity, um, and also the notion of, of, of ten, and I'll talk about, you know, there are ten heavenly realms. If we look at the construction of the entire comedy, we've got 33 cantos for Inferno, 33 for Purgatory, 33 for Paradiso, and one introductory one, bringing us to a total of 100. So the number ten, the one and the zero, um, are very important. It's the Alpha and the Omega. It's the beginning and end. A hundred was considered in Dante's time to be the number of perfection. It's ten to the tenth, ten times ten, right? Uh, ten, ten times over. So that idea that God is both beginning and end. It's the beginning of the counting system and the end of the counting system. Again, Dante's playing off this idea of perfection. Um, and then buried within the poem, you will see further num number keys. It's almost like watching um, National Treasure right or reading uh you know reading some dan brown book where you've got this da vinci code where you've got clues that are leading you to other things dante's written in such a way that it's almost like a a, a detective story in some ways um so that's a little bit of the structure uh there's obviously some more i could talk to you about but i wanted to keep the lecture fairly short we're at about 14 and a half minutes now so um as you have questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, I'll be glad to answer anything you have tomorrow or next time. We'll talk some more about the introduction, like Canto 1, okay, uh, and what's going on there. We may even read a little bit of it. All right, have a good day.